Right. So uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ingrid Rodriguez. I'm the CEO of Iconic R&D. We're a research and development company in the oral healthcare space with a, a definitive interest people, planet profits in that sort of order. And it is my absolute delight this evening to um, be running this panel session of inclusion to impact for female tech entrepreneurs. Um, being one myself, it's a topic very dear to my heart. Um, and um, it gives me great pleasure, delight, and um, I feel very privileged to be joined by two of our four panellists. Um, I think we're having technical issues with the other two. So for the moment, I shall introduce um, the two lovely ladies that we've got on our panel, and, um, and then uh, we'll move forward should uh, Kim and Vivian join us. So um, first of all, um, we've got Liz. Um, Elizabeth O'Day, I should say. Hi, Elizabeth. And she's the CEO and founder of Laris, a precision medicine company that uses pioneering metabolic platforms and proprietary machine learning algorithms to fundamentally improve how disease is diagnosed and treated. Um, Elizabeth also plays an incredibly active role in partnering with government leaders and global organisations in advancing the field of precision medicine around the world. And in 2016, she attended the first United States Women's Summit convened by the White House and was recognised as a nominated change maker. My goodness, go you. <laughs> I really look forward to hearing your, um, your discussion points. And I also have Maribel Monterubio, um, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Vitalis Mexico, a 29-year-old international company that has become one of the top 10 independent financial advising firms in Mexico. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, Maribel is a Mexico City-based economist and financial manager and is a true pioneer of responsible investment practices in Mexico. Um, where she has actually played a very prominent role as a promoter of responsible investment principles in Latin America, which has led her to develop a proprietary methodology for ESG assessment. Um, Maribel has under her purview almost a 1,000 corporate customers, which impacts more than 500,000 workers through retirement and savings plans. Thank you so much to both of you for being part of our panel today. Um, this is just such, I, I, it's such an enriched platform and I'm just very excited um, to hear from you both. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll start with something that I just read recently and then we'll go into um, both of your um, presentations. And basically it was um, an article, the 2019-2020 Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Report that details that challenging economic times can ignite entrepreneurship, jump-starting job creation. And in the US in particular, minority women-owned businesses were particularly strong job creators and stabilisers of the economy following the 2008 financial crisis. What um, Hala Hanna, who's MIT's like um, Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology, they have a, a group called, a platform called Solve, which... Um, I believe from my memory, don't hold me to account, um, they're focused on social entrepreneurship. So it's a marketplace for social impact and social entrepreneurship where they connect startups with funding and resources to solve global challenges. I read an article of hers that was titled Supporting Women Entrepreneurs is the Key for Real Global Economic Recovery. And in that article, she wrote that necessity motivates women to start businesses and decreases their fear of failure. And as one of the data points for Solve, the 2020 Global Challenge saw an actual increase in percentage of submissions by women from 38% in 2019 to 43% in 2020, which was, you know, at the beginning of that pandemic. So... Um, in face of this extraordinary shock of pandemic, um, Halal says that women entrepreneurs have been responding to great, with great enterprise, agility and optimism. Um, and that the finding that women are quick to shift their business models to become more relevant has been confirmed repeatedly. I guess the one thing I want to leave with this and then um, go into you with um, going to your discussions, Liz, is that, and, you know, it would be great to see your perspective and on your discussion points, is the one comment she makes is that we must ease capital constraints for women, like it's the most significant hurdle women entrepreneurs face. 
um, and is un- is there unequal access to finance in comparison to their male counterparts? And this is true across the board, right? It's not just the US, yeah. it's globally. Um, and it did find this, um, I think it was a Boston consulting group, that US women founders receive only a small fraction of their successful deal, um, which I think was 4.4% and only 2% of all capital. So this enormous gap was narrowing until the pandemic hit. Um, and now in 2020, funding to female founders was down 31% from 2019, while funding for all male teams dropped only by 16%. So in light of our two questions of how we can support, where to support women as entrepreneurs and what sort of mentoring is needing to be funding more capital, it'd be great to hear from you, Liz. Oh, hello. <laughs> I want to say hello to Kim. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and I'll give an introduction to you shortly, Kim. Um, is if you could actually, you know, talk from your perspective, your point of view, um, in terms of how how you have found this and um, your points of discussion. Yeah, sure. So thank you so much, Ingrid, and everybody for having this panel. I'm excited to uh, get to talk and and learn from everybody on here. Um, so you know, Ingrid, I think you know. I'm so glad you started with data because that's where I think we need to start. So when I started my company seven years ago, um, the number of venture dollars going towards females was abysmal. And seven years later, it's still quite terrible. I think I, I, maybe it's something still like 85% of all venture dollars go to male teams. And that makes no sense when you also compare the metrics for how female entrepreneurs perform. In almost every category, we, you know, um, spend our money better, deliver better returns. And so this disconnect makes no sense. And I think the first way you solve anything as a data scientist is by measuring it and putting it out there. And so that's what I think we need to do is just do a, a better job or continue to highlight the gaps and not just on a sort of large macro scale, but in the micro scale, like how many female entrepreneurs are there? in you know the boston ecosystem or within certain venture firms and really challenge people to try to increase you know the diversity of of their funding um because again when i think of entrepreneurs that like have that tenacious i'm gonna make this work you know and put my whole heart mind body soul into it the majority of those people are are women right so um i think first we have to acknowledge that there's a gap And then I do think we need to start to put in like systematic processes to help women access that funding. And um, one thing for me, it's really interesting. I just started my own angel fund and being on the other side of the table now as an investor, it's super interesting to see and people come and pitch to me and automatically when I'm listening to a woman entrepreneur, first, I can see how she's probably been terribly conditioned to not be as bold as she wants to be, or, you know, maybe be a little bit more, um, what's the word, like, not as confident in certain areas, not because I don't think she is, but because she's like, unsure of how to like navigate those waters. And I immediately can say like, okay, stop, like, let's just get to this. And let's tell me your science, tell me your business, tell me what you're going after. And like, let's get to the point. And the companies that I've invested are now women. And that's not I, I will invest in the best entrepreneur. And it's it's interesting that like, you know, you can, you tend to invest in what you know, right? And what you can trust yeah. and things like that. And so I think, um, you know, we need the data, we need more women entrepreneurs, we need more women investing in, and on that side of the table, because I think that will funnel into creating more entrepreneurs as well. So um, I think the whole ecosystem needs to just be uplifted. Um, and I'm happy to dig in more, but I'm, I'm curious what my, my other panelists have to say. Sounds good. Thank you for that um, and uh, for providing that insight. And I am interested to get to Kim shortly after Maribel, but it's interesting, um, is how you said you've just jumped into the, the investor side of things and I'm, I've got something interesting to speak to at that after we hear um, Kim and Maribel. So um, Maribel, um, you were sort of like keen to sort of have a discussion around the renewed sense of empathy since the pandemic and, you know, how this sort of lessens frictions in the balance between work and family, um, but also the the importance of promoting um, EC, um, ESG impact investment principles 
um, moving forward. So thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to Oasis for this invitation and the opportunity to participate in this great panel. Congratulations for this magnum event. Thank you very much, Ingrid, Kim, Cleese and Kim. I am pleased and honored to be, to be here with you sharing this panel. Uh, for me, inclusion is an ideal, a work in progress and a reality. As an ideal, it guides and motivates us to collaborate, closing the gaps of exclusion that are still present in our country and in our world. The ideal of inclusion has many dimensions. I want to mention three of them. Uh, first, inclusion at the workplace. Since the Industrial Revolution, the assumption was that we must adapt to the challenging mechanisms of the factory. Even professional work was adapted to this factory logic. If someone was unable to adapt to this gigantic machine, the problem was the person, not the mechanism. The view of working place as a mechanism and, and always marching behemoth generated frictions, fractures between the working life on one hand and the family, social and political life on the other. This peculiar organization of work was extremely detrimental to women and often forced them to choose either work or family. We now understand better that the working place and the working hours could and often should be adapted to different necessities and conditions of people. And I hope this will be one of the lasting positive learnings of this terrible pandemic. We are, at least to some degree, entering an era of a new ergonomics of work with a renewed sense of empathy, flexibility, and creativity. And the proper technology, we at Vitalis, for example, have integrated a diverse team. Our performance was not hampered by the pandemic, to the contrary. This ergonomic of work benefited women the most, just as the former mechanistic view has harmed us before. A second dimension is, this, is the work in progress of closing the gap between the rich countries and the developing economies, just like Mexico. This can only be achieved by the professionalization of the financial sector and the adoption of the best international practices especially in this region, in governance. That's why since 2018, under my purview, Vitalis became the first Mexican asset management to adhere to the principles of responsible investment supported by UN. This initiative seeks to integrate these ESG factors into the investment processes. We have been introducing to our clients and partners in Mexico and the rest of Latin America to the ESG perspective in an effort to bring our region's financial sector closer to the vanguard of responsible investment. Investing today for tomorrow is how the financial sector will do its part in raising up to the epochal challenge of climate change for an inclusive, sustainable future. Finally, and this, the third dimension, we are actively promoting a responsible saving culture for retirement in Mexico, a, a country with traditionally low rates of savings for, for retirement. Vitalis de designed and launched the very first, first digital platform in the world, Save as You Spend, Miles for Retirement. Miles for Retirement allows everyone with a smartphone, a credit or debit card, and a public retirement account, which is mandatory in Mexico, to save a percentage of every expenditure, let's say a coffee, a flight, a cinema ticket, your insurance bill, this is automatically routed to the personal retirement account to the user. Also like other loyalty programs, Miles for Retirement offer benefits from different participating brands and sponsors. With more than 150,000 users, we are now the platform that sends more voluntary contributions to the public pension account system in Mexico. By saving and responsible investing today for tomorrow is how we close some of the gaps that still, still exclude many people in our country and Latin America from a future of new beginnings. So thank you very much for letting me share this with you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much, Maribel. And I do believe that it's a, definitely a conversation discussion and it's not even an option. It's just a necessary and must do to include these, um, you know, environmental, social governance principles um, in businesses across the board, um, government sectors, um, industry, etc. 
Um, I will now like to introduce Kim Folsom, who is the co-founder and CEO of Founders First Capital Partners, a revenue-based investment and advisory support investment platform. Um, Founders First Capital has provided funding and growth support to over 200 companies and is the largest private provider of growth funding for service-based businesses and the only minority and women-led revenue-based venture platform with $100 million in committed capital. Incredible. Um, as a social entrepreneur, um, Ms. Folsom is dedicated to leveraging the power of market forces and sound business practices to address disparities in revenue and job growth among businesses led by underrepresented founders. Um, with um, Kim, um, I just, I, I was sort of just reading some information uh, a few days ago in an interview where um, I think you interviewed in a podcast called um, I'm There For You Baby podcast, mm -hmm. um, which focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and you spoke about the racial obstacles that you had to overcome in your entrepreneurial journey that led you to start seven companies, which I was just mind blown. Oh my goodness. Um, so you have experienced, you know, I know you've got this investment fund now, but you've experienced both sides of the table. So, um, you know, I'm really um, fascinated to hear what you have to sort of um, share with us today in terms of, I guess, um, Firstly, I think it was more along the lines of um, what type of innovative impact, uh, in what type of innovative impact investments or uh, options are evolving for diverse-led small businesses looking to grow in the post-pandemic economy. Um, and I think there was a couple of questions here around the potential threats to the US economy um, impacted by inflation on the flow of ESG and impact funds for social racial equity initiatives and if there's a little bit of time, maybe you could talk to um, how might the wealth and value creation of businesses led by diverse led founders impact overall forecasts for the US economic growth. Thanks, Liz. Um, sorry. Thank you, Kim. Sure. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. Hello, uh, uh, fellow panelists. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to join you this evening as we celebrate uh women's entrepreneurship and women's history. Um, I am delighted to be here and contribute to the conversation. I have had the benefit of being an entrepreneur for over 25 years, and that was the only way that I was going to be able to, uh, one, solve big problems and uh, be have access to the C-suite. The so that's one of the reasons why I have, you know, pursued my entrepreneurial journey. So that's one one piece that I wanted to, to share. Um, and, uh, you know, Founders First is my seventh venture. Um, so it's not like, you know, I've been at this for seven years. We're actually going into our, se our seventh year at Founders First. But, um, you know, when I started uh, in the crazy.com era, you know, it was recognizing the fact that, you um, if I, if I wanted to go through and do what I did as a software engineer, what I spent, you know, my time uh, prior to this and, and have the same opportunities provided as my colleagues, that's one of the, the issues that I had to go through. But I will tell you, I was a, you know, square peg and going through a round hole to try to, to do this. Um, but, you know, the other factor that I learned is, you know, if you look at it from an investment standpoint and being all money is green, and being able to demonstrate that you can add value, provide returns for your investors, then you can win those, you know, hearts and minds and pocketbooks. You know, unfortunately, it's one person at a time, but that's kind of the, that was the playbook that I had to develop, which was different than, you know, my fellow, uh, you know, engineers that, you know, went through the, hey, I was part of somebody else's team that, you know, got access to capital and grew and uh, and then, you know, decided to, to venture out on my own um, when I was uh, in my first venture in the in, you know, in the 90s, many of my investors had said, you know, Kim, you should consider being on the other side of the table. And I was saying, you know, what? it took me eight years to figure this out. So I'm not <laughs> certain if I want to go through and do this. But going from, you know, that journey in the 90s to, you know, five, six uh, uh, you know, startups later and still seeing the same issue, you know, um, 
of uh, not seeing access to capital to, you know, um, women uh, led businesses, businesses led by people of color, um, you know, was like, you know, either I can stand on the sidelines and hope somebody's going to fill in, in uh, a reason to be able to move forward, or I could do something about it. Um, but I, you know, as you shared about our platform, it's different than your traditional equity platform. You know, most of the 30 million I raised before I launched my first launch founders first was equity funds. You know, the ones that, you know, you're going to, you know, uh, sell, you know, a percentage of your company and, you know, everybody wins when there's a liquidity event you know, of some type. But there's so many things that can happen in between that road to, to making that happen. And I looked mm -hmm. at other models that, you know, where was where were other folks building wealth um, and also providing more opportunity? So in Founders First, we are not focused on being wanting to create and fund the next unicorn companies. We've actually uh, mm -hmm. decided to focus on their their cousins the Clydesdale and the Zebra companies. These are companies that are small and medium sized businesses. And why? Because those small businesses, those ones that, you know, pre pandemic um, were considered those businesses mm -hmm. under, you know, 250 employees. But in all reality, those businesses that are under 50 employees in the US are the major uh, employers. You know, 90% of those small businesses that are less than 50 employees, they employ 35% of the workforce. But when you really dig into those fastest growing businesses, we're not represented. You know, uh, you know, women led companies are very smallly represented and businesses by folks of color. And reason being one of those, uh, it's, it, it's capital is a big element but also know how I was talking to uh, presenting at a uh, private equity conference at Harvard uh, a couple few weeks ago and and uh, recognizing so many really great brands, not the, you know, next Facebooks and Twitters, but you look at um, hotel brands, car, you know, car resellers, lots of different solution providers that had anywhere from 10 to a hundred to $200,000 to be able to create a significant, um, you know, impactful business and brand. I mean, and then the fact that there's so many solutions out there that are created for serving this market as well. I mean, think about the companies like Spanx. Um, that's a billion dollar brand focused on solving a problem for, for women. And, you know, she started that business, uh, Sarah Brakely started that business with $5,000. You know, there's so many, and, and so many businesses like that, that uh, have those ideas and have the ability to get started and have some traction, but they're not going to attract equity capital, um, you know, until they get substantial size. And if they do, they're going to have to give away, you know, a substantial amount of their business. And the only way the investors get paid back is with a liquidity event. So with our model, we use um, like a royalty share. We're like a, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cost of goods sold for service and light manufacturing businesses to help them be able to grow and get access to six and seven figures of capital so that they can invest in products, people, marketing, you know, infrastructure to help them be successful. And just the other side of, um, you know, the statistics that were shared by the panelists that spoke before me is recognizing the fact that when only 95% of folks get access to capital, or even when you look at the post pandemic, you know, it's a little bit bigger, better of 2021. That means that those businesses aren't getting opportunities to create jobs and contribute to the economy. And, you know, uh, organizations like American Express has done a ton of research around if the access to capital was much more equalized, that would contribute trillions of dollars to the overall U.S. economy. And then you have the multiplier effect of if that was done with a global scale. And so that's where we're looking at being able to demonstrate um, that when you invest in these diverse um, folks, that they contribute to the economy, 
They contribute to their community, their wealth creation, and not just for the founder, for the investor. And they don't have to wait three, five, seven, 10, 12 years to get that return. It's much more of a shared uh, uh, outcome. Um, and so that's what we've been doing for the last uh, six years. Wow, that's just incredible, Kim. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure the panelists will all agree, um, especially with Liz going on to the investment side of things now, as well as being an entrepreneur yourself, Kim, and Maribel on the investment side of the table. Um, it's this sense of collaboration and all working towards a shared goal is something that's really coming up strong um, in terms of post-pandemic um, and, and starting to see alternative um, business models, as you've just discussed, Kim, that, um, you know, we were needing to be creative in order to sort of support small to medium-sized businesses that don't fit in that sort of um, VC, sort of venture capitalist sort of investment um, of pitching, you know, for high uh, returns and quick returns and, um, you know, 10 times the, you know, um, and you get started a lot quicker or sooner. I wanted to go towards... Um, getting access to investment because we still have a fair bit of the old business model which is you know having to transform in some shape or form and unfortunately as tech entrepreneurs we're still stuck in that model um we need more models of like yours kim to to help move things forward but um i came across and saw a presentation um i think she actually came to australia um dr dana ken's and I don't know if you ladies have come across her, but she's an assistant professor of organisational behaviour at uh, the London Business School. She is American, but she started her career as an investment banker and a strategic consultant for Citigroup and the Winterberry Group. And then she herself went on to co-found and ran a venture-funded startup, um, and she's now in education around this. Um, and her her whole focus in, um, in in studying she studies implicit gender bias in startups. Um, and it was really interesting to see um, what her research has di discovered and uncovered time and time and time again. And like she's done over 2,000 sort of pitch presentations where she sat there with the team, watched how the investors um, gave questions to the entrepreneurs, men versus women-led companies and so forth. And what she, her research uncovered um, and I'd like to see what your experience has been with this. And I think, Liz, you might be able to relate because, um, and actually you too, Kim, from the earlier days, but what she uncovered is that male entrepreneurs, there was this 67% questions targeted at the male co like founded entrepreneurs were promotion-focused yeah. questions. Um, the questions towards the females were prevention-focused questions. So 66% of the questions that were folk, um, given to the female entrepreneurs were prevention-focused. So from the outset, the female entrepreneurs were having to defend their position and de-risk and mitigate the risk of investment for the investors. Um, and whereas the, the guys got to sort of promote and, and do the high-level visionary, you know, and that was yeah. sort of a point for that um and her data was you know quite balanced because there was no difference in the way entrepreneurs were presenting their companies because she even looked at the way entrepreneurs were stepping forward and she did notice that both male and female entrepreneurs while presenting um their pitches used similar degrees of promotion and prevention pitching so that was excluded from it um and even with the female vcs um she thought they would be pro the female entrepreneur, but in fact, it was like, isn't it birds of a feather flock together? The <laughs> female VCs did exactly what the male counterpart VCs did was um, ask these prevention led questions. Um, so um, it was just really quite insightful. And I think that she, her, her um, advice to female entrepreneurs were was to actually, um, when you're asked a prevention-led question, shift the focus of the question and move towards promotion. Um, so, you know, I guess, Liz, I'd ask you to speak to that and I'd like to hear what Maribel and Kim have to say about that too. Yeah, well, well Ingrid, I will agree and I will say that I have certainly lived that as well and, and perhaps others have, you know, I think... Um, 
I have, I think, been asked to do more, prove more, you know, demonstrate like success on a far thinner budget, just in all ways, shapes or form have to like double or triple or quadruple prove myself as qualified, where male counterparts, you know, um, I think are just given that benefit of the doubt, right, which is wildly frustrating. And I don't know the stats that you uh, talked about, but Linda Babcock wrote, two books that I love, Women Don't Ask and Ask For It. And she had very similar statistics that were just like, unfortunately, because of how the world works and how when women are viewed, it first of all, you're always put to sort of defend your big dream. And how are you really going to pull that off? And are you like, are you being too naive, you know, and that is, um, it's really challenging from an entrepreneur because as an entrepreneur, you're motivated and inspired to go change the world, right? That's why you started your company or you're doing something because you believe you have something that's cooler, better, faster, cheaper, going to improve something. And to have people kind of ask you to diminish your dream is, mm -hmm. is a real challenge, right? And, um, but then what I find equally frustrating is that when you prevent, so, so like when you then sort of adapt to these questions and say, okay, instead of presenting, like, I'm going to transform healthcare and I'm going to, you know, change how diseases are diagnosed and treated, you present like a more short term goal, you get equally like razzed, you know, of not dreaming big enough. So there's this like super delicate line that women, I think, have to you know, balance and juggle. And, you know, I think once you acknowledge it, yes, there are tactics that you can do. And I think those are the ones when someone ever asks me like a ridiculous question like that, I'll just rephrase and say like, oh, I don't know, like perhaps my PhD in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, like should make you feel okay about that from Harvard, you know, um, and just like have a little bit of like humor with it, you know. Um, but um I don't know that that's right, right? Like I'm a, I'm acutely aware of it. And now like before I pitch, I take kind of like a read of the room of like, what's that level of big picture that's gonna be like received um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the room or not. And you know, anytime I like misjudge, I often say it's like, um, so in, in biology, when you're like studying rats or like you can do conditional behavior. And so like, you know, if you, if the rat touches like something, a treat can come out. And so he constantly like touches it and the treat comes out or like touches it and gets shocked, you know? And that's kind of how I feel like sometimes here it's like, oh, you hit the thing and you got shocked again, you know, like, let me like regroup on how to, um, how to present here. Um, so it is alive and well, like to this day. So despite, I would say my company success and all the different things I'm doing just a few days ago when I was um, telling somebody about the new funds that I was putting together, his response to me was, aren't you a new mother? Um, which I said, oh, wow. yes. And what in the world does that have to do with anything? You know, and if anything, yeah. it's making me, you know, more fire and committed um, to, to just change this world. But you're put on that defensive. And so I think women just unfortunately have to know that and then come up with these tactics. And once you get to that level, also just have fun with it and be like, dude, you're being so dumb, you know, and, and move forward. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, yeah. Kim, I was going to ask you that, Kim, did you have to constantly prove yourself more than your male counterparts, especially in, in, in software? Oh, constantly. I mean, and it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't stop. Um, it didn't stop you know, it, it was constant. I mean, from as a, as in my professional career, um, my entrepreneurial career, and now my career as an investor, um, I, I run a structured finance company. Um, and it, and the reality is when you are a fund manager, uh, especially as a, you know, a woman or woman of color, it generally takes two, three, four times longer to raise a fund because of that same thing. It's like, there's not a, um, and, it, and a, a model that people have seen that, you know, someone with your, you know, profile or what have you has done that. And, you know, if and the other factors, people being able to get comfortable, comfortable with the thought of innovation, not coming from an individual that has this particular 
profile. But I recognize that's just the playbook that I have to play with and that I have to operate on facts. I mean, mm-hmm. I raised my first Series A as a profitable seven-figure company where my male colleagues did it with, you know, a PowerPoint. And this is what I'm thinking about I'm going to do. But, you know, oh. that's just the way, way you know, the game's played. It's still that right now. which Exactly. Is I mean, and like, so, yeah. I, you know, and so where I have gotten to the point of, of where we have with, you know, our current fund, it took, a, you know, a much longer period of time. But I know that, that um, for me to get to where I want to be, it's based on data. It's based on fact. It's facts. It's based mm-hmm. on historical factors. But I'm delighted to share as my portfolio is not just investment in women or men, but my the women in my portfolio are kicking ass and taking names. And it was the <laughs> fact that I have selected them as portfolio candidates equally. It was based on the merits of what they're what's possible of what they do and the character of the individuals and their ability to say not just, you know, what they are going to do, but what they've done as well. Um, but, um, you know, the reality is I, I I don't have the magic wand of the benefit of the doubt. It's just, you know, maybe in some generations beyond me, but I don't see that happening right now. You know, when we get away from the, you're the first woman or the first person of color doing this stuff, you know, for the majority folks there. And then the other side of being in the decision-making, um, you know, role on the other side of the table that says, hey, she did X, Y, and Z. The unfortunate thing is the decision makers about allocation influence, um, you know, is still, we're still not at those tables. We're still yeah. asking for permission. We're still being considered based on that. Now, given that that is the reality, that means that there's opportunities to build allyships with people that are on those tables. And that Absolutely. means you've got to do the work of saying, I'm, before they get together in that room and talk about me when I'm not there, I've got to spend time with each one of those people you know, before and their networks to see and count the votes that I've got before they get together um, and recognize what are, you know, no surprises and commit yeah. to them that there's no surprises on the other side. But that's the playbook that I have to have mm. have utilized, you know, for all these years, because I'm not going to get the benefit of the doubt because yeah. they're not used to, you know, uh, working with somebody, you know, because even though we may have gone to the same schools, we may have worked at the same places and all yeah. that other yeah. stuff um, yeah. until they, I have delivered for them. There's yeah. that doubt. Yeah, this is yeah. quite interesting. And Muddy Bell, I'm watching you yes, nod yes. and nod and nod. And no doubt you've had to prove yourself. I mean, you've pioneered this whole ESG um, principles component. I mean, like, what? Can you no, no, I, I, what I wanted to say is that those are the unconscious biases that the world has, you know, like women sometimes have second guesses and we want everything perfect to be able to to make a presentation and 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 we fear about not doing well and i think men are more aggressively and as they say well they get a powerpoint and they present just with that and that's it right so i think what what i think we should be aware of this and and at least notice that that we are feeling like that and that we are having second guesses and that we are doubting about ourselves because it's 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 very common. It's it's something that we do automatically, you know. So so I think this is something that this is the way it is, and we need to change, and 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 we need to first be aware, and 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 try to 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 be confident and to know that these dreams that we are pursuing and that we want to change the world, they are big enough for a woman or for a man but but we need to believe that that we are yeah. capable of doing it and that we don't need to be perfect in order no. to do it so Absolutely. we need to work in that to be aware and try to be less have met, has less doubts mm-hmm. i think um you you raise an interesting point there and i can certainly relate um running you know my research and development company in the oral healthcare space um 
I did a, 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 I was brought into uh, the Queensland government, brought in all these international companies and Australian companies into Queensland to help boost the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And one of my counterpart um, entrepreneur companies came from Israel and they'd been in Silicon Valley and, and he'd, he was such a hustler, you know, and he had a fintech company and he'd raised millions of dollars, you know. And I thought, one day I thought, maybe I just need to, like strengthen my hustling muscle but and I tried it on in a pitch and it was just so incongruent um Mm. and I spoke to the investors afterwards and I said I was just trying it on because I needed to see whether it's something I did need to strengthen in myself or not and all the investors said never change who you are like Mm -hmm. you stay true to who you are and the right investors will align with you um, and invest in you and your company because it's you first and foremost um, and then the business. So it was a really valuable lesson but I needed to to trial it, you know, to see whether um, it's going to be effective or not. I can't believe that time is running short already. They do cut us off. So what I will ask is um, it's been really fantastic speaking with each and every one of you and I do want to just get... Um, I guess if each one of you could provide to whoever's listening on the platform, whether it's an investor or entrepreneur, um, even um, government, if you could provide um, one piece of advice for each of those groups in terms of how we can better support women entrepreneurs um, and what sort of mentoring is needed to help get more funding for for women in business. And I'm happy for any one of you to, to take the lead on that. I can start and then others can jump in. Um, So I think first we need to create a culture where women feel comfortable celebrating their own accomplishments and then we celebrate each other's accomplishments. So I practice this thing called, you know, yes and or no but. So anytime I get an offer to do something, I say either yes um, and let me also recommend this amazing woman, you know, that you should know or no, I can't do it, but there's somebody else who you guys should know because she's changing the world. Um, And I think we should all just make that default of what we do. And then like governments, venture capitalists, I challenge people to put, to look at how much they're actually investing in women and then set up systems to make that more equal because people think like, Oh yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sexist, but numbers don't lie. And if you have not invested in like a women led company, you know, like that's, that's just not, not right. So, um, no. that, yeah. Thank you. I, I think like, uh, like, as Kim said before, like forge relationships with other entrepreneurs or investors and, and go to the table, you know, start talking with them and start being part of them and, and, receive feedback and and be able to be open and to 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 forge these relationships i think um, mentoring also could help a lot you know what other women have women have already done and if you are a new entrepreneur maybe having this discussion with with women that have already crossed that path would help a lot so I think we need to, women need to learn how to networking because sometimes we are kind of <sighs> introverted and not so, so to be, ex, be ex, uh, more social. So I, I think like for those networks and mentoring could help a lot to, to entrepreneur women. Thank you, Maribel. And yourself, Kim? Uh, just you know, I think they, they hit it on the head. You know, one is the, you know, support, uh, collaborate, you know, amongst us ourselves and lift each other up. And the other side of it is for those, there's, you know, um, guys have so much influence, even not writing a check, but promoting and advocating um, yeah. is so important. And being able to go through and be a willing, I mean, they can go through and say, you know what, in order for me to support you, you need to pr- prove that you're going to do X, Y, and Z. But being open to those things are really important. Because, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, behavioral, social, uh, you know, inten- unintentional things that it's going to be difficult for 
as I said, maybe in the next generation, but the behaviors, you know, aren't going to change that quickly. So the first thing is asking for them to be open to doing this. Like I always tell people, you know, the one thing that you can do is be able to leverage your expertise and your access to network, advocate for some woman to help her, um, you know, leverage, you know, what, what uh, accomplishments you have that will just be amazing yeah thank you very much um and in summary i would concur with um, everything that each one of you said um and as women um i believe and i still have read a lot of data that um, we've got to stop being so competitive with each other um and be more supportive and and celebrate each other's um wins and and boost each other up, you know, um, and and bring that sort of sisterhood um, together, so that um, you know we can forge forward and create these big changes that we're all inspired to do in the world, whether it's in finance or healthcare, um, etc. So, in saying that, I want to thank each and every one of you. You've been absolutely wonderful. It's been insightful, and I've thoroughly enjoyed um, sharing sharing this panel session with all of you, Kim, Liz, and Mar Maribel. Um, and I really value your contribution. There is um, one final quote that I came across recently. Um, it's on this pipeline website of all things, but it just said, as more female founders forge forward, someday a woman tech startup founder won't be an exception. They will be the norm and exceptional. So on that note, I'd like to wish you, each and every one of you, a very lovely and peaceful evening. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.